This distinguished audience might not take your word for everything you have to say today. I hope they'll be open-minded and I am certain they'll receive you warmly. So with that, I'll introduce Brian Josephson. Well, there seem to be a few people who've had, who've sort of seen something which science hasn't, and these ideas all fit together. Um, the concepts outside the conventional domain, and um, I say the first of these probably uh, more or less goes back to uh, David Bohm, uh, who uh, he actually got interested in a mystic himself, Krishnamurti, and so he considered what thought was, and he came up with the idea that there must be, uh, to explain the funny things happening in quantum mechanics, there must be an underlying order, which he called implicate order. And his, uh, well, uh, Bohm died quite a time ago, but his colleague, um, Basil Hiley, still continues uh, this, and he's come up with some interesting mathematical developments, which may put it on a clear framework. But anyway, uh, as I say, a, a lot of people um, seem to have this idea that there's some kind of unity, and um, the question of how it works. Um, and uh, well, I'm going to uh, give my own take on this, which I've been developing with someone called Alexa Yardley. Um, and I'm going to talk about extend it in terms of extended mind. Now, as you've heard a little bit, the scientific establishment is typically hostile, tries to suppress ideas either actively or passively. Now, this um, is the Cambridge News article, a very odd business. So let me now get, start to get into the details of this. Now this is all very preliminary. Um, okay, as I said, a lot of people sense that there's some order present in nature, more order than is, is accepted in the current paradigm, but it's rather difficult to characterise it. Our usual methodology doesn't work, a very mathematical methodology. Um, I'll uh, get into why that doesn't work. Um, so it's really difficult, but I think progress is being made. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, people, some people are giving well-argued um, accounts. I get uh, a number of people wanting to send me books with their um, ideas in, and they, they, they usually quite a, uh, a lot of them make sense. Uh, now, it's worth mentioning that this is not, although, uh, well, what students learn is just this is the theory and you do this and you get the results out. It hasn't, the development of science hasn't always been that smooth. Um, one example is superconductivity where it took 40 years before people um, actually understood it, uh, uh, understood what caused it. It seemed to be impossible. This is a process by which the electron flows without encountering any resistance. And so, um, well, in, in that case people just hadn't got a clue as to what was going on. Quantum mechanics is a bit different. Now, you may think, well, quantum mechanics is a cut and dried theory, but really that developed in stages. The first thing, I believe, was, um, well, if we, we ignore Bohr's theory, which was a really different theory, uh, was the Broly's idea that electrons are waves, and he uh, showed in his thesis that um, you could say a particle is bent, trajectory is bent by a force, but you could equally well say it's being refracted by a medium. So that was the first inkling of quantum mechanics. And then Heisenberg and Schrodinger developed totally different ideas. Uh, I'm not sure how, those, how quantum mechanics could have got on with just those ideas, and it required Dirac to unify them with talk of observables, and once Dirac had done that, um, it was possible to treat more than one particle. And surely it just had waves in ordinary space, but actually for two particles you need six-dimensional space and so on. And, but uh, Dirac's method allowed you to do this generalisation. Even then, things went on, things like uh, quantum field theory, and it got more and more elaborate, and then things got stuck, which is one of the um, things uh, points I'm going to mention, that uh, turned out the two very good theories can't actually be compatible if you've got um, particles but no gravity. There's a pretty good theory called the standard model. If you've got gravity but no, no quantum mechanics, then you've got general relativity. These are both very accurate, but um, it's unclear what theory uh, you could apply if you, if you have both together. So there's a, a real problem with the idea that you just have a mathematical theory of everything. Uh, well, besides this, though, uh, the things which I was interested in and which led me to uh, characterise my uh, what I was doing as a mind-matter unification project is there are lots of things where mind is involved, where it doesn't really look as if ordinary science has got it right. Uh, well, the first one, mathematics, is something that Penrose has talked about. He suggests that you can't really explain our mathematical intuitions with, um, in terms of a brain. 
Well, his arguments are, um, are actually disputed by a lot of people, but I think his uh, conclusions are right, and certainly nobody's shown how this kind of thing could be done, how, how mathematical abilities can be explained in terms of artificial intelligence and so on. Music is uh, another interesting thing. Uh, I collaborated with a musicologist at Trinity called Dennis Carpenter, and um, uh, we were both suspicious about what psychologists said is all that's involved in music, it's the unexpected and so on, and patterns, and so we produced an argument which you can find on my web pages that um, aesthetics involves something different and rather subtle, that music was doing something of a, uh, a kind like, well, sort of like turning on genes or something like that, but it didn't take that very far. Another thing is the puzzle of the observer in quantum mechanics, and the observer is supposed to collapse wave functions or not, but uh, if you try and say uh, the observer isn't really doing anything, then you get into many worlds and things which you can't observe and it's all very unsatisfactory. And in fact, um, I have a paper, um, I think that was the paper which was on my, my post actually, uh, that um, Niels Bohr said he didn't think the quantum mechanical approach with calculations and biology were things which could be reconciled. He was batted down by uh, physicists turned biologists, but I, I, I think that um, Bohr shouldn't have given in and his argument was uh, a valid one. So there's a problem. Um, uh, Non-locality is um, a strange thing and this sort of gets us into things like the paranormal. Uh, well, um, perhaps I, I won't say any more about that. Now, I may say something about it later, but this is there are awkward things to explain, be explained, and even whether there's intelligence involved in evolution. It's um, uh, uh, a lot of people have pointed out that actually um, the arguments, well, you can perfectly well reconcile uh, some creation which is not within physics, is, uh, is not inconsistent with evolution. Um, anyway, so there are various issues which um, a lot of these involve minds, so I was interested in how minds could be brought more properly into science. So there's the Mind Matter Unification Project. Well, now to get on to some more significant issues. <clears throat> there are things which represent real problems. Um, okay, well you've probably all heard about chaos, the butterfly effect, and so on. Uh, the point here is that um, uh, it's assumed it was uh, in a sort of Newtonian paradigm that you just specify your system, run your computations through and work out your predictions. But um, it was realised by, um, uh, well, I've forgotten his name, um, but um, that isn't so. It was a meteorologist doing calculations and he found that um, uh, if you change the conditions by a minute amount, you've got a completely different result. So that rather throws a spanner into the works. Uh, so there's a question of how you can do science if you've got chaos. Um, now, uh, I should have referred to some people. If you look at my previous lectures, you'll find I've uh, referred to Fuchson and someone. There's a paper on the archive where we talked about order in chaos, and this is one of the stimuli here. So um, you, you might, there might be some order that you can still talk about even if you can't do a conventional calculation. Um, but uh, people don't like it when you say this. My, my paper saying that, well, I have a paper, um, uh, the limitations of universality of quantum mechanics, which nobody's disproved this argument, but uh, people want to ignore it because they like to think they have a universal theory. And the thing is that... Um, Science is a selective process. You do problems you can solve. Uh, therefore, you do things where you can calculate the results and you, you, uh, you let slip under the rug the fact that some things can't be calculated. Uh, I've mentioned the elusive fear of everything. Um, okay, so to um, get on to my point, um, as I was saying, you can investigate, you can surely investigate some things even if the reductionistic process um, doesn't um, always work. Uh, there was once a, a, a lecture which um, Stephen Weinberg gave where he said the hours of explanation are always down to up from small to the up and unfortunately questions were not allowed or I would have pointed out that actually in biology uh, that's not how it works. You sometimes explain things in terms 
lower level things in terms of higher level things. Um, so there are, in other words, other kinds of explanation other than the standard physics explanations. So uh, what can we do? Um, let's focus in particular on life to see where this is going to get us. Um, my title, you remember, is Life Extended Mind. So can we... Um, uh, is life just a matter of physics or is it something else? Uh, well, one difficulty, uh, I go back to chaos, the sensitivity dependence, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Um, okay, what biologists do is they look at what they see and they say, oh, we have this system and this system and these systems together fit into this bigger system. And the trouble is that isn't a real explanation because because of chaos, um, just putting the parts together doesn't explain the whole system. Uh, I think you're probably aware it's um, difficult to assemble something and get the parts to fit together correctly. And so there's a real problem here, how, um, which is generally ignored. Um, why, why do you have these higher level systems which act as a, a unit? And you can't actually explain it just by enumerating the parts and say that they interact. So the fact that you get units is an important thing. They are units that persist, um, <clears throat> like cells persist for a time, the organism persists for a time rather than disintegrating, and all sorts of systems which um, carry on. And the fact they persist is something rather complicated because systems help each other, um, keep watch over each other, and they, if anything is going wrong, they, they, um, they do something which puts things right. So that's a thing which is beyond things that we really have proper theories for at the moment. And then, well, if you try and do this properly, you find awkward problems. Um, this has been a sort of difficulty in doing this project properly. But what actually is a system? How can you define it? What are interactions? We uh, physicists and people who construct things deal with nice, well-defined systems. You is this component which behaves in a well-defined way according to an equation and, and the interaction is just a current flowing from one to the other. But in a biological sense, uh, it's not what constitutes a system is well-defined. It's not well-defined. Um, systems are what they call emergent. You, um, uh, you find this in weather. Weather patterns just emerge, but they're not very well-defined. And if you have, say, a patch of mist... You can't really say where that mist is because it hasn't got sharp edges. So there are difficulties, and you can say, well, these are, at least we have models, and that, that's better, but then you have to say, what is a model? So there are all sorts of difficulties to this enterprise, um, and uh, as long as you don't really think about what you're doing, you can do science. You, you, um, you're trained in how to do things. And I, at one point, I was puzzling as to say, what actually is thinking? What is clear thinking? And I came across the average, and we think that we think clearly, but that's only because we don't think clearly. Once we start to be able to think clearly, try to think clearly about what's going on, we realise it's not awfully clear what, what thinking is. Okay. Now, to get more to another things, um, uh, if we consider how is it we're able to do science, well, one thing that people may have come across is the idea of uh, fractals, which is really that you can... It's like the big fleas having little fleas on the backs to bite them. Uh, little fleas have lesser fleas and so on ad infinitum, and you might get to smaller and smaller structure. Well, the usual idea... Uh, people like to think you come to an end and you get to your theory of everything. But that might not be the case. Um, and in fact, what uh, we believe is the case is that there's just an infinite amount of stuff going on, and so you're never going to be able to do uh, a proper theory, and that what you're really doing is grasping at what is relevant for what you want to do. Um, so what, what is of interest? Well, in biology, it's the organisation that's of interest, so the question is, what can we say about that? Um, one of the things I said is, um, I'm been focusing on is circular theory 